Okay, enough of that. Um, more music, so thought, what the hell? Start all this stuff out with music, right? It's cool, it's fun. Anyways, time to talk about the next lecture and the real business cycle model. And now we're going to be looking at the general equilibrium and the steady states for the model. The general equilibrium is going to be where, you know, okay, we've already gotten all of our equations. We've got the household's equations, we've got the firm's equations. Basically, we're just going to stack them all up on top of each other, and that's going to describe our system of equations. That system of equations is going to have basically every possible variable inside that set of equations identified. It's going to be explained. There's something that will allow us to go like, okay, cool, if this changes, then everything else can change too, and here's the mechanisms through which it will change. And it's, you're going to see a lot of equations, and hilariously enough, this is actually one of the simpler general equilibrium models out there. But, you know, it's... Sometimes there's a lot to explain, even when it's simple. Now, with the steady state stuff, um, I thought about having you guys figure out how to find the steady states on your own, um, but it just didn't really seem pertinent. Uh, again, this isn't a course in the mathematics of monetary economics. This is really just a course in monetary economics. So I found all the steady states for you. Essentially what happens in a steady state is you've seen some of the equations where there's like a T subscript for a variable and then like a T plus one subscript for a variable. Um, in a steady state, what's going on is we're simply just assuming that whatever that variable is at time T, it's exactly what it is at time T plus one, T plus two, all the way up to T plus N as N approaches infinity. In English, that means these variables aren't changing. Or if there's some growth rate to the variable, the variables are following the same growth rate over time. Nothing is changing, basically, right? You can think of these variables hitting a flat line and staying flat, all of them. We want to know where they're staying flat, and then what we want to do is we want to go like, okay, let's impose a shock to one of these equations, see what variables respond, when they respond, how they respond, the direction in which they respond, how much they respond, and whether they will return to the original flat line they were following, which is called a steady state, or if they will converge to like a new steady state, right? If it converges to the original steady state, it's what's known as a transitory shock, right? Or like a temporary shock, you could say. If it achieves a new steady state after the shock, well, that's a permanent shock. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of that stuff, but uh, the overall, the main point of the steady state is what are these variables doing and what are the equations describing these variables doing when the variables aren't changing? And well, with that, let's just go ahead and get started. So we already did the optimization for the household. We've done the optimization for the firm. Now we need to collect all of those equations, put them in to get, like, into one giant system of equations, and that will give us all of our equilibrium conditions, right? So we had the optimization problem. I know it says in the last chapters, it really should have been like in the last lectures. Oops, sue me. Please don't actually, I, I can't afford to get sued right now. Um, but we had an optimization problem and we kind of put all the equations together. Um, but what we're gonna be doing now is getting the real point of this dynamic general equilibrium across, right? Because, well, you saw some math, but didn't really get the point of what was going on. Now this RBC model is gonna give us a pretty cool indicator of what's going on when we put everything together because we've got optimizing households and we've got optimizing firms, right? Households, you know, for example, optimize how much labor they wanna to provide to the firm, which gives us an idea as to what the labor supply equation is. But when the firms optimize, they figure out how much labor they need given how much they wanna produce, which derives a labor demand type system, right? So with the labor supply and labor demand, well, if we put them together, that's an equilibrium, right? So we can think of this as like a two-stage process in the modeling. The first stage in the process is the optimization, right? Everybody optimizes, but then everybody optimizes, but there's an equilibrium that's determined via that optimization. So we've done the optimization, now we just need to learn the equilibrium. Technically, in this sense, governments also optimized, but they didn't really. Now, in the next model, they will optimize. But given what this model is designed to say, governments aren't doing much here, right? But they all come together, right? They all have like a big dinner party or another 
party with like a keg or something. I don't know. Maybe the government's doing keg stands and the firms are like, yeah, get the government really drunk. Make them pass out so they can't do anything to us or something like that. I don't know. Anyways, here are the eight equations that describe the general equilibrium. I know it looks like a lot. So I'm going to go through them one by one. Equation one is the Euler equation I talked about. It describes the flow of capital, or sorry, the flow of consumption over time. And it's weighted by how patient we are, that beta term, and what the marginal product of capital less the depreciation rate on capital is. So the marginal product of capital, remember, it tells us how much more productive our firm will be if we add an additional unit of capital. So that alpha times a times k to the alpha minus one times l to the one minus alpha, that's the marginal product of capital. That plus one minus delta, that's accounting for the rate of depreciation of physical capital because capital is going to fall apart. So when you add capital to the firm, right, when the household here lends capital to the firm to let the firm try to produce more, not all of that capital is going to actually go towards growing the firm. Some of it's going to go to replacing existing capital that's just beginning to fall apart, right? Like I gave the example about the grill before. And if you run a restaurant, you're going to have parts of that grill that fall apart. So this is going to go like, all right, well, if I'm going to add one unit of capital, let's say 5% of that unit of capital goes towards replacing existing capital that had already fallen apart. So by including that in there, we're saying, okay, this is the remaining capital that we're adding in, and we want to see how much that's contributing towards productivity for the firm. The more that delta term, depreciation, the more that goes up, the more capital we need to actually invest in order to start getting the capital to add to the firm's production function. So if depreciation is, say, 10%, right, well, only 90% of every unit of capital we invest is going to go towards new capital. The other 10% is going to replace old capital. If that goes up to, say, 0.9, right, well, 10% of the existing capital that we're throwing in there, right, the new capital that we're throwing in, 10% of that goes towards growing the firm, 90% goes towards replacing what's already fallen apart. Not very good. So... That's kind of what's going on here. The next equation, equation two, that gives me my labor supply and my labor demand stuff, right? That theta over one minus L times C, that's labor supply. That one minus alpha times A times K to the alpha times L to the one minus, or sorry, times L to the minus alpha, that's labor demand. And labor supply equals labor demand equals the wage rate. Right, so by setting labor supply and labor demand equal to each other, right, see if, hopefully you can see the mouse here, labor supply, labor demand, when labor supply equals labor demand, we have an equilibrium real wage rate. So this is describing labor markets. This is explaining the time path of capital investment. IT is investment, and it's new capital minus old capital less the rate of depreciation on old capital. Equation four, this is my production function. All right, this is the function that describes aggregate production inside this economy. Equation five is GDP, right? This is what's known as a resource constraint. It sort of ties output, which is production, to consumption and investment, which is defined up here, All right? So what this says is output is equal to the sum of consumption and investment. Okay, I mean, that sounds like GDP minus the government part, right? Think of it this way. Output can't be exceeded by the sum of expenditures on consumption and investment, right? If output's $100, you can't spend $75 on consumption and $75 on investment, right? Because then output would be exceeded by that sum. It would be 150 equals 100. That doesn't work. So this is a constraint that makes sure expenditures are equal to the source of funds. Equation six is an Euler equation. Same idea as this right here, except it's for bonds, right? And these bonds 
can exist for both the firm and for the government. We're assuming those bonds are identical here. This equation, equation seven, tells me that my marginal product of capital is equal to the real interest rate. And we covered that in the last video fairly extensively. And finally, equation eight is my demand for money. Now you're probably going like, well, where's money supply? Well, if I threw in an equation for money supply, all it would be saying is that the central bank is just setting money supply equal to whatever this is. Right, if we solve this whole thing out for this MT plus one, right, that would tell me what my demand for money is. The central bank would look at it and go, okay, cool, we're gonna set it to this. Boom, done. So these are all of the equations that describe the general equilibrium in the real business cycle model. Now you're not gonna have to you know, plug through all these equations and work through them and all that stuff. You might see one or two that I'm gonna have you play with just to kind of see what some of these relationships are because hopefully if you can play with some of the relationships, go like, okay, well, if capital goes up in equation four, what's, how's output gonna change? If you know this theta term in equation two goes up, How's labor supply going to change? What's that going to do to the wage rate? Things like that. It's going to be very like mechanical in the sense that it's not going to be deriving all these equations. It's going to be playing with some of the equations to see how some of these things are going to change. And that's honestly the more important part here. So, well, I said we can talk about what each equation is um, and the role that it plays in the propagation of shocks. So I don't see the point in talking about it again if I just talked about it. Uh, but let's talk about some steady states, right? Let's talk about what that means. Now, the steady state is like a dynamic equilibrium. All the variables are assumed to be trending towards their steady states at any point in time. But there's one in particular that we need to talk about, because you're probably going like, all right, dude, you know, we've been doing this business cycle model, and that's great, but like, what the hell does this have to do with monetary economics, especially if the monetary authority is not even doing anything in this model. Well, bear with me a minute. You gotta crawl before you can walk. So, which one are we gonna talk about? Well, money. I mean, it's a class on money, may as well talk about money, right? In the steady states of this model, an interesting thing is none of these real variables are affected by changes in the money supply. So think for just a couple of seconds about what you think, where you think you've heard that before. A change in the money supply doesn't affect real variables. In other words, a change in the money supply only affects nominal variables. Think about what that is. Think about what, where maybe you've heard that before in this class. And I'll give you like a few more seconds to think about it. I really need to get like the Jeopardy theme song music or something to play. That'd be kind of fun. All right. Well, the music is done. Alex is curious. And they want to see your answers. And if you wrote down what is monetary neutrality, well then, you'd probably be correct. And there'd be like a doo -doo 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 sound from Jeopardy like you know when you do well and everyone's like cheering and they're clapping and they're happy because somebody, you know, got extra money. Because we all love when you get more money, right? Well, Awesome. Yeah, monetary neutrality. So if no real variables are affected by a change in the money supply, boom, monetary neutrality or possibly monetary super neutrality, depending on whether we're dealing with levels or growth rates. So let's look at some of this stuff. Well, the way we solve this out, and don't worry about how to solve this out, I will solve it for you. It will only be on you to interpret what's going on. When we solve this stuff out, first we have to solve for steady state output. Well, the way that we do that is this. Well, actually, technically, we have to first solve for steady state capital, figure out what steady state capital is, and plug that into output, which gives us steady state output. But if we look at this, right, this is expressed as like a capital labor ratio, where steady state output is equal to that a term in its steady state. I know it says ass. It's like, hey, he said a bad word. He said ass. I said it once and I'll say it again. Ass. Um, this ass here, this ASS, is the source of shocks, but it's like when they're in their steady state, right? 
it's equal to that times this alpha, right, which is the, what was it again? Capital share of output, that's correct. Multiplied by that source of shocks, divided by rho plus delta. Rho is included in that beta term that you saw that tells us how patient we are, where rho is actually a measure of how impatient we are. So beta says how patient we are, but it's a function of rho, where rho tells me how impatient we are. And then we add the rate of depreciation. So anything in the numerator here, right, right here, anything here is good stuff, right? This will increase steady state output. This stuff is bad. This will decrease steady state output. So if rho goes up or if delta goes up, steady state output will fall. And then it's to the power of alpha over one minus alpha. I wouldn't really worry so much about how I got that. It's, I just, I did some math. So just look at this. This is our steady state output equation. Now, from this equation, there's something kind of interesting. Is money in there? Well, this obviously isn't money. This isn't money, right? This is a source of shocks. It either shifts output up or down. So that's not it. Alpha is not money. It's capital share of output. Again, the source of shocks. Rho is how impatient the consumer is. That's not money has nothing to do with money. Delta, rate of depreciation on physical capital. It's related to a real variable, first off. Excuse me, money is a nominal variable. Second, it's not money. There's no MT here. Well, if alpha here wasn't money, then alpha here and here are also not money. So we can infer by looking at this that steady state output doesn't have money in it. So if steady state output doesn't have money in it, it's incredibly likely that it is exhibiting monetary neutrality. Therefore, a model is said to exhibit monetary neutrality if the steady state values are not affected by changes in the nominal money shock. Or rather, if real steady state values are not affected by changes in the nominal money stock, because nominal variables will also have steady states that they follow. But if the real steady state values aren't affected by any changes in the nominal money stock, boom, monetary neutrality. But as Billy May said, but wait, there's more. Models said to exhibit monetary super neutrality if the real steady state values are unaffected by changes in the growth rate of the nominal money stock. Okay, so awesome. Let's talk about the Euler equation, right? This explained the flow of consumption over time based on how patient we were and what the marginal product of capital was, how productive the firm was if we were to invest a little bit more capital in that firm. Well, okay, flip some stuff, do a little bit of math. This right here, equation 12. Well, steady state consumption over steady state consumption. Again, don't worry about how I got this. Just worry about what this equation is and really to that extent you only need to worry about what it is in terms of how you see it on a problem set or an exam. This thing's equal to 1 when we're in the steady state because steady state consumption over steady state consumption, well anything divided by itself is just 1. So that means this whole thing right here is equal to 1 when we're in the steady state. So if the current stock of capital is less than steady state capital, right? If steady state capital, basically where capital should be in the long run, right? We can think of steady state stuff as what's happening in the long run because these things are trending towards their steady states. So steady state capital is like long run capital that's unaffected by shocks. That long run capital is greater than the amount of capital that we currently have in the economy. Well, the marginal product of capital is going to be larger than the marginal product of capital in the steady state. Well, what does that mean? Well, remember, the marginal product of capital is high when the capital stock is low. The larger that capital stock gets, the less the marginal product of capital gets. Another way of putting that, think about it in terms of the price, right? The rental rate of capital. If we don't have a lot of capital and we want to add one more unit of capital, there's going to be a massive return on that investment of one additional unit of capital. 
However, if we've already got a lot of capital and you want to invest one more unit of capital, the rate of return is going to be a lot lower. So the marginal product of capital for the capital that we currently have in the economy is going to be rather high if the capital stock is low. And if the capital stock is lower than what it should be in the long run, that means the long run marginal product of capital is going to be lower than the current marginal product of capital. And that means the right hand side of this equation is going to be smaller than one. Well, what happens? What, how do we fix that? Well, basically, we fix that by investing in more capital. Because currently, the marginal utility of consumption is declining over time. Right? And we don't want that to happen. Right? So it's optimal currently to postpone consumption to accumulate capital to have capital or to have consumption grow over time. So we want consumption to grow over time. We don't want it to fall. Right? You don't want to be able to get less consumer goods tomorrow than you're currently getting today. So what you do is you go, well, hey, currently the way the market looks, <clears throat> it's better off if I were to invest some of my current like earnings in capital and not consume as much because tomorrow I'll be able to consume a lot more. Now, nobody in their right mind in the economy, not even brilliant macroeconomists such as myself, We'll look at this stuff, right? We won't look at the economy and go, hmm, okay. So the marginal product of capital, for given the amount of capital that we have in the economy, is less or is greater than what the long run marginal product of capital should be. Therefore, I will invest. No, we don't do that. No. What we do is we look at the way interest rates are behaving. And based on what those interest rates are, will determine whether or not we want to invest, right? Because if the marginal product of our capital, current capital, is really high, that means there isn't enough capital. Firms want more capital. And if firms want more capital, what are they going to do? They're going to pay more to get that capital. So if they're paying more, there's a higher interest rate. There's a higher rate of return on investment in that firm. We recognize that and we go, oh, oh, there's a high rate of return. I'm going to invest in that. Maybe I won't get to get, you know, a cool new guitar this quarter. Or maybe I won't be able to get, instead of a Kemper profiling it, maybe I won't be able to get an Axe FX3 or a Nero Quad Cortex. I desperately want one of those, by the way. Um, really just to shoot it out against a Kemper and see which one's better and then sell the crappy one. But I'm not going to be able to get that today. Because I'm going to save the resources that I earned in order to be able to invest to get more stuff tomorrow. So I don't get the Axe FX3 today, I get it tomorrow, or I get it next quarter, next year, whenever. Now, it may end up being I don't get the Axe FX3, I get like an Axe FX4 whenever that thing comes out, although I doubt it's coming out anytime soon, the 3 came out in 2019. But the point of the matter is we look at the interest rate and we decide to invest on what that interest rate is. A high interest rate indicates a high marginal product of capital, which indicates a low capital stock. So as long as we have this right here, right, where the marginal product of capital less depreciation is greater than one over beta or one over how patient I am, this process is going to continue. I'll keep investing. And as the capital stock grows, the marginal product of capital declines until eventually we reach equality, right, where this marginal product of capital less depreciation, this thing right here, is equal to one over how patient I am. Now, the converse is also true. Consumption only remains constant when this equation is held, right? When we reach equality through this like mechanism. The central bank were to increase the rate of money growth, which leads to an increase in inflation. Well, it induces households to accumulate more capital. But you're probably going like, wait, Jeremy, whoa, whoa, I thought you said that there wouldn't be any changes. Well, I said there wouldn't be changes in the steady state. Lowers the marginal product of capital, right? Because this increase in inflation means the price level is going to go up. As that's happening, households are like, we want to accumulate some more capital, and it's going to lower the marginal product of capital. 
which leads to the flip side of what you saw. So here the marginal product of capital is lower than basically what it should be in the steady state. Households then would want their consumption path to decline over time. But wait a minute, Jeremy, I thought you said households didn't ever want their consumption path to decline over time. Well, yes and no. What's gonna happen is basically they're consuming too much. Wait a second, no, sorry. I'm sorry, my brain completely died. Households were accumulating more capital, lending more capital to the firm, which is lowering the marginal product of capital. And what's gonna happen is they don't want their consumption path to decline over time. They want to, <clears throat> Actually, no, they do, because they want to increase current consumption. I am so sorry about this, guys. They do want their consumption path to decline over time, because right now what they're going to want to do is when the marginal product of capital falls, the interest rate falls as well, because the interest rate is equal to the marginal product of capital. So if the marginal product of capital is, you're like, ah, I don't really know what the hell that means, don't worry about it. Think about the interest rate, because the interest rate is equal to the marginal product of capital. So if the interest rate falls, what are you going to do? You're going to increase your current consumption. But based on that resource constraint where output was equal to the sum of consumption and investment, and investment was defined as the flow of capital over time, well, if your return on capital investment falls, what do you do? You increase your current consumption and you reduce your investment capital in the firm. So basically, what we're going to see is you might get some short little changes here, but steady state capital is going to be independent of the rate of inflation. So let's kind of recap this for a second. Steady state output is unaffected by inflation. Steady state capital is also unaffected by inflation. Because if there is an increase in either the rate of money growth or even in the level of money, I've got the rate of money growth here, but it can also be in the level, it increases inflation. When inflation increases, households want to accumulate more capital. It lowers the marginal product of capital. Households go, well, I'm not getting this rate of return that I wanted, right? Because as inflation goes up, what happens to the real rate of return? It falls. So the real rate of return falls. The real rate of return falls. They're going, well, why am I investing if I'm not getting anything back, especially if I'm not getting back what I actually kind of, you know, wanted to get back in the first place. I'd rather just consume now because if I save while well, I'm putting myself, you know, I'm giving myself some kind of a current disservice. The only reason I would want to save is to be able to benefit from that in the future. But if the interest rate's low, I don't get to benefit from that in the future. Why the hell would I? So you go, all right, screw it. I'm going to consume more now. My consumption path is going to decline over time because I'm not going to consume as much tomorrow or the next day or the next day, right? But I'll still be maximizing my utility because as I consume less and less and less, right, that interest rate's going to go up and up and up. And eventually we're going to reach an equilibrium here. So, okay, what is affected by inflation? Well, the interest rate on any asset that pays off in units of money at some future point in time is going to be affected. So the real value of those future units of money will be affected by inflation. What do I mean by that? Well, if you print more money and you keep printing more money, what's gonna happen to every dollar that you hold? Well, the central bank prints more money, that dollar that you have becomes less and less useful, right? You can buy less and less with it because the purchasing power of that dollar is being eroded. As Ronald Reagan once famously said in the 1980s, greatest president of my lifetime, once said, and I'm not saying that with sarcasm, Ronald Reagan was a fantastic president. Um, and here I was saying I wouldn't politically indoctrinate you guys. Ronald Reagan was pretty cool. Um, oops. Oh, well. As Ronald Reagan once famously said, inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. Well, if you increase how much money is being printed, you don't 
you're, you're not increasing the number of goods that are being made. You're just increasing the amount of dollars circulating in the economy. Every dollar you hold is going to fall. If they keep increasing this money growth, right, or they keep increasing the stock of money even, well, the real value of that future dollar that you plan on holding is going to be affected by inflation. What's it going to do? It's going to fall. And this real value is reflected through the interest rate that's required to induce individuals to hold the asset. What interest rate is that? Is that the nominal interest rate or is that the real interest rate? If you said the real interest rate, you would be correct, right? The real interest rate is what induces the individuals to hold an asset. Now consider the nominal interest rate, right? Consider the nominal interest rate that an asset has to yield if it's going to give a real return in terms of consumer goods. Well, this asset is going to cost one unit of consumption today, and it's going to yield one plus the interest rate units of consumption tomorrow. All right, if I buy an asset, that's going to cost me one unit of consumer goods today. But the hope is that I'd be able to purchase that unit of consumption tomorrow plus a little bit more. Right, that's the whole point of saving. You consume a little less today to be able to consume a lot more tomorrow. In units of money, this asset's just going to be equal to P, units of money, today. Now, since the money of each unit of consumption tomorrow, T plus 1, is going to be equal to the price level tomorrow in terms of money, the asset must pay an amount equal to 1 plus the interest rate times the price of that unit of consumer goods tomorrow. Thus, the nominal rate of return is equal to this. And you're kind of going like, all right, what, what the hell is this thing over here? Well, 1 plus the real interest rate times PT plus 1 minus PT over PT. So let's factor this 1 plus the interest rate out, right? Ignore this whole thing. Just look at everything to the right of my mouse right now. PT minus or PT plus 1 minus PT over PT. Well, that's 1 plus the rate of inflation. So I get 1 plus the real interest rate times 1 plus the inflation rate minus 1 is equal to the nominal interest rate. This right here is another way of representing the Fisher equation. 1 plus the real rate times 1 plus the rate of inflation equals 1 plus the nominal interest rate. Now, if I were to subtract 1 from this side here, this is what I get. And this will be a lots of math reduced to 1 plus the real interest rate equals 1 over how patient I am. Now, I'm going to call this pi SS here the steady state rate of inflation. Steady state nominal interest rate is given by this. So the nominal interest rate in the steady state is equal to 1 plus steady state inflation over how patient I am, minus 1. This varies 1 for 1 with inflation. For every unit of inflation increase that we get, inflation goes up by 1%, right? Well, the nominal interest rate is also going to go up by 1%. If inflation drops by 1%, the nominal interest rate drops 1%. Okay, so enough of that. There's going to be some problem sets that are going to help you work through that and sort of see exactly what I was talking about with that. Because I know it's probably going to seem a little mathematical. Don't worry about that. The problem set will help you understand what's going on. Now, inflation generates revenue for the government through something that's known as seniorage. Now, you've probably heard people, now it's usually like the, the crazy libertarians like Peter Schiff. I hate Peter Schiff, by the way. The guy's an ass. Um... Just in case you're like, hey, is he going to politically indoctrinate me? Well, I guess I can't if I'm going like, well, Ronald Reagan was pretty cool, but then this super libertarian free market guy isn't. It's kind of crazy. He's like a tinfoil hatter. Um, hopefully, you're still going like, I don't know where the hell this guy is politically, and that would be great for me. Um, inflation generates revenue for the government through seniorage. You've probably heard guys like Peter Schiff say things like, well, you know, the government's just inflating out their debt. Technically, they're right, and still somehow hilariously, technically, they're wrong. But what's happening is every single time the central bank buys government bonds, 
right? They buy the government bonds on the open market. Every time they do that, they're converting this bond, right, which is what the government sold to basically be able to borrow money and then have to pay back later. Well, when they do that, right, the money that the government gets by selling that bond, the government can then go out and spend. But then people are holding this, this treasury note, right? And the treasury note is kind of liquid. You can sell it, right? But in terms of what, what else you can do with it, you can't do much. So if the government comes in and buys that treasury note with a treasury bond, what just happened is the government, after the exchange between the treasury and the public takes place, where the treasury sells this bond, this bond is now in the open market, the central bank comes in and buys that bond. Now, this isn't necessarily like an intentional thing. It's not like the government was like, you know, when they were coming up with the Federal Reserve Act of like 1913, they're like, you know what? Let's go ahead and range, like arrange it so this can happen. It's not quite the case. It just happens to be a little like byproduct of it that can be sometimes useful for the government. The, gov or the Federal Reserve buys that treasury and converts that treasury to cash. So if the treasury was $1,000, right, you just gave the government $1,000 to go out and spend, they got to pay back. You lost that $1,000, but now you've got a piece of paper saying you're going to get $1,000 plus interest. The Federal Reserve buys that piece of paper from you. And they buy it at a discounted present value where basically you're being compensated for the like stream of interest payments throughout the maturity of that bond right now. They buy it. But now what's happened is, let's say there was a zero interest rate, so the Federal Reserve buys that bond from you for $1,000. Well, the government now has $1,000 that you lent to them, but now you also have that $1,000 back. So what happens then? Well, instead of the federal government paying you back, they pay back the Fed. But as they've basically just introduced $1,000 into the system, into the economy that wasn't there before, right? Because before that, you just had a fixed amount of money, $1,000 went to the bond, bond went to you, that's it. Now that bond's been converted into $1,000. So there's $2,000 floating around rather than just the $1,000 that there initially was. If you increase the money supply, what are you doing? Well, you're driving inflation. You're decreasing the value of some of these goods, right? Namely the treasury, right? Why, why is the value of the treasury decreasing when everything else technically isn't? Well, the treasury's gotta be paid back at $1,000. But if you increase the inflation rate, the real value that needs to be paid back technically falls because inflation goes up, but the price of that bond that was issued yesterday, even though the price level goes up today, that price level stays the same, that price level isn't being adjusted for inflation. So if the government engages in seniorage, just a little bit, they generate inflation, which reduces the real value of their debt, which makes it easier for the government to pay back their debt. So we're gonna look at the budget constraint for the central bank. This ST is seniorage, and it's equal to one plus the inflation rate times the future stock of real money balances minus current real money balances, right? So that's a flow of money over time. And then I got this minus RCBT. Those are receipts from the central bank. That's being subtracted because any earnings that the central bank makes through their open market operations, anything they earn, right? You can sort of think of it as like any profit from their open market operations has to go to the treasury, right? So if they buy a bunch of treasury bonds, earn money on it, the money they earned goes straight to the treasury. So this flow of money is seniorage. Now I've got receipts from the central bank. Central bank's profits are given to the treasury or the fiscal authority. Now, we also have the fiscal authority's budget constraint, and that's this. This GT, what is that? That's government spending. GT is equal to tax revenue plus basically their flow of bonds because they can get money from selling a bond today but they have to pay it back tomorrow. So plus the bonds they sell today minus what they got to pay back tomorrow, 
or actually what they have to pay back today from what they sold yesterday, plus the seniorage, plus receipts from the central bank. Notice here, it was minus receipts from the central bank. The central bank has to send these profits over to the fiscal authority. So what the central bank has to give up, the fiscal authority gets to earn. So the fiscal authority can tax and borrow. The fiscal authority has no control over monetary policy, right? Because do you see an MT or an MT plus one? Nope, you don't get that. Similarly, the monetary authority has no control over fiscal policy because do you see a BT or a BT plus one here? No, because they don't issue bonds. They buy bonds, but they don't issue them. Fiscal authority issues bonds, monetary authority buys the bonds, prints money in order to buy the bonds, and then introduces that money into the economy. So if we combine the fiscal authority, right, government spending, if we combine that with this, you can see I got this plus ST here, and ST is equal to this stuff. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> If I combine them, I get a really long equation. I get a really long equation with some stuff that cancels out, namely that minus RCBT plus RCBT, right? So let's cancel that out. Receipts cancel and it gives me this. Now government's budget constraint, when I include the fiscal and monetary authorities, is equal to tax revenue they get by taxing people plus the revenue they get by selling a bond, minus what they had to pay back today from what they sold yesterday, plus the flow of money, right? You can think of this as, if I got one plus the inflation rate times MT plus one, basically that is discounting tomorrow's real money balances by the rate of inflation today, minus today's real money balances. What is that? Well, this is the amount of money that is created, right? The flow of money over time is how much new money is being made. Right? If there's $100 today and there will be $100 printed tomorrow, right? or sorry, $102 printed tomorrow with $100 today, what's, how much money was just made? $2. That's what that's telling me. So we can say if the central bank wants to print more money, they can, and it helps the government finance things. But it does more than that, like I said, because it reduces the value of the debt the government already owes. So let the government debt be defined as just the flow of bonds, right? They sell bonds, BT plus one, but they have to pay back BT. And remember, right, this is sort of a, you can say like a bastardization of the Fisher equation. It's expressed a little differently, but it says the same thing basically, right? We can think of this as one over one plus the real interest rate equals the inflation, one plus the inflation rate over one plus the real, or the nominal interest rate. You kind of flip that around just a little bit. What you would see is you would get one plus the inflation rate times one plus the real rate equals one plus the nominal rate. And a, an approximation of this is what you saw earlier, where the nominal rate was equal to the rate of inflation plus the real interest rate. So if inflation were to increase and we held the nominal rate constant, what happens is, well, the real interest rate has to fall. So in nominal terms, the value of the government debt that has to be paid back by the government drops. This is what's known as monetizing the debt. In theory, the government has a hard time paying their debts. They could inflate their debt away. They can only do this like very, very, very little and in very small doses. If we overuse it, we end up like this, where this poor guy is probably taking that entire wheelbarrow of currency, banknotes, whatever you want to call it, to buy something like a loaf of bread. Maybe you heard, you know, after World War I in Germany, where Germany got hit with some pretty nasty reparations. They had to pay back basically like all of the debts that the countries that won World War I um, had incurred, they had to be compensated by Germany. Well, in theory, yeah, 
It's like, okay, Germany really pissed a lot of people off at World War I. Not quite as much as they did in World War II, but they pissed a lot of people off. And so they piss a lot of people off, hit them with sanctions, right? Make them pay back what a lot of countries had to pay in order to win the war. Problem is, Germany didn't really have that money. So what did they do? They just printed it. They printed a lot of it. They printed a lot of it so much that they reached hyperinflation. And you've probably heard about that wheelbarrow of Deutschmarks that was required to purchase a loaf of bread. That's what happens when the central bank prints too much money. Now, the last thing we'll talk about here are two theories of the price level. There's two theories. There's the idea of monetary policy dominance, right? Like the monetary theory of the price level. What happens here is that fiscal policy is assumed to adjust to ensure that the government's intertemporal budget constraint is always in balance. So basically it assumes that the monetary authority has dominance here, right? Monetary policy is active and fiscal policy is inactive. Monetary policy is free to set the nominal money stock or the nominal rate of interest to whatever they would like. So fiscal policy is passive, monetary policy is active. This is kind of what we're seeing in the United States right now. Central bank is independent of the fiscal authority, right? I'm sure you've probably heard about monetary policy independence or independence of the Fed. That's what's going on. Now, some of you might have heard about things like audit the Fed, right? We want to audit the Fed. We want to basically make sure we know what's going on. Well, sadly, audit the Fed is one of those terms of like semantic overload where you're like, well, it sounds pretty good. Like, yeah, it's audit the Fed, except, you know, the Fed's kind of already audited by an independent organization, but whatever, we'll talk about that some other time. Um, but what would end up happening is the fiscal authority would end up having a lot of control over the monetary authority because who would be auditing the Fed? It'd be Congress. Congress would audit the Fed and the Fed would basically be beholden to whatever Congress said. In that case, we would have fiscal policy dominance. This would be known as the fiscal theory of the price level. The fiscal authority would set its expenditures and taxes without regard to any requirement for the intertemporal budget balance. The value of these taxes isn't sufficient to finance expenditures, right? So they go, we want to spend, you know, a trillion dollars, but we only have like $700 billion of taxes that we're bringing in. Well, okay, we got to borrow some more money, but let's say they only want to borrow $200 billion. What do they do? Well, they can just go, hey, Fed, snap your fingers. Basically, their little Fed, Federal Reserve lapdogs would come over, and they say, we want $100 billion. And the Fed goes, okay, cool, here you go. Well, in that case, seniorage would have to adjust to ensure the government's intertemporal budget constraint is satisfied. In this case where I talked about under monetary policy dominance, where fiscal policy was passive and monetary policy was active, instead what we would see is passive monetary policy and active fiscal policy. We'll talk about this a little bit more, probably at the end of this chapter, the end of this like section, this model. Um, however, for now, I'm just gonna leave it here. Uh, there will be a problem set up within the next day or so, and uh, it's going to give you a little bit of practice on some of this stuff, and hopefully it works out rather well for you guys. So um, there will be other videos coming as well. We'll hopefully wrap this up by the end of the week, and uh, we can move on to some bigger and better things. So thank you for watching, and keep a lookout for a new video not long after this.